Hello, uh, the topic for today is uh, our first large scale theory of distributive justice, uh, and that is uh, the theory of justice that is given in John Rawls's book, A Theory of Justice, right? So they just don't sort of name him like they used to, and you can tell John Rawls is a philosopher because when he writes a book about a theory of justice, he simply calls it a theory of justice. Really good at naming things. All right, so what we're going to be talking about here, um, starting with Rawls and continuing on through the rest of this unit, is a concept known as distributive justice, right? We've been talking about political or governmental justice. That is the kind of justice that addresses questions about what a government ought to be like, why have one to begin with, um, uh, those sorts of things. Um, distributive justice is also called economic justice, and it's the concept uh, in which uh, it's the name that we give to a family of issues relating to how a society decides who gets how much of what and how they get it. Okay, And so every society has to make decisions about this. And when we say um, uh, how much, we mean how much of really everything, not just physical resources, not just money, uh, but also access, uh, power, authority, uh, basically any kind of social good. Uh, we can, we're going to be very expansive about that. Uh, but of course, any society has to distribute that thing out. It has to decide how much of, of all of that stuff uh, each person gets and how they get it. Uh, they have to decide what the system is for, for doing one thing or another. Uh, you can't have a society without anything like that. So um, the idea is that whatever system you have, you want that system to be fair. And that's the sense in which we want to talk about distributive or economic justice as having, having a kind of fair uh, system. And so the major question we're going to end up addressing is uh, what is it that actually makes a society's distribution just, right? As it's like, what does justice mean in this case, right? What's uh, what's really important uh, in in evaluating whether a system is fair? And so, uh, uh, in addition to paying attention to what different folks say about uh, distributive justice, pay just as much attention, probably even more attention to why they say so. Like, what, what are they actually pointing to? What's their reasoning for saying that one particular thing is important in deciding whether a particular society has a just system of distribution uh, or doesn't, right? So what kinds of things are involved? And the first of, of, like I said, the first of those folks we're gonna talk about uh, who gives us a theory, a very influential theory of distributive justice, is this guy here. Uh, this is John Rawls. You'll notice from the black and white photo, of course, um, that uh, he's, he's no longer with us. Um, he died in 2002, not too terribly long ago, actually in the very same year as his uh, sort of notorious frenemy, Robert Nozick, who we'll actually talk about next time. Uh, he worked at Harvard uh, most of his career, uh, and he's uh, very famous for a book he wrote in 1971 called A Theory of Justice. Uh, it's a book that is uh, absolutely, to this day, still worth a read um, because it has sort of outlined one of the, the major theories of distributive justice that has stuck with us even to this day and pro uh, provides the sort of the foundation for one uh, sort of major perspective uh, on distributive justice that uh, you'll see. So even people who, who don't necessarily know that that's where some of these ideas came from uh, will will still uh, repeat some of these ideas uh, that are Rawls's ideas about distributive justice. So uh, before talking to you about uh, Rawls's theory, I want to give you a little bit of an example that will serve as useful background for why Rawls thinks the way that he does about distributive justice. And so what we see in front of us here is this uh, this uh, sort of image uh, of of a a blind taste test, right? Um, this is a fun thing to do at parties, uh, you know, uh, if, you know, once those things happen again, uh, this is, uh, uh, but the whole point behind a blind taste test, right, is to, um, you know, sort of, you know, put put numbers on stuff, you you don't know what the numbers correspond to, uh, and you sort of try it, and, and the idea is to be objective, right? Because, of course, people have assumptions about, about all sorts of things, and so you can't just taste a bunch of things uh, with the packaging intact, like knowing what you're tasting, and expect uh, to, to really be objective. In a sense, the blind taste is all about uh, depriving you of information that you know might bias the result. Right. So if you're trying to decide, as this picture appears to, uh, which beer is the best one, uh, notice you're going to have some assumptions, right? You're going to know uh, if you see the packaging, how, how much some of those things cost. You might have an assumption that something that costs more is going to taste better. Uh, uh, you, you know, and so you might uh, know that perhaps a brand that's familiar, you think you, you one thing you, you might think you prefer one brand to another, uh, but in a blind taste test, it might not turn out that way. 
again, depriving yourself of some information uh, ends ends up giving you a, putting you in a position where you can actually make a better decision. You can make a more informed decision uh, because you're not sort of loaded down with any assumptions that you might make, any biases you might make. And so I think it should be very clear that one of the main purposes behind doing a blind taste test, right, is to be fair, right, to all the, the products in question and also to remove any personal biases that you might have, even if you don't even know that you have those biases, right? You, you still you still may have them. Um, and so then the idea is that once you, you know, sort of, you know, blindly sort of, you know, rank everything, then you get to look and say, okay, what did I actually really think, you know, not knowing certain things uh, was the best and what wasn't. And the results, again, may surprise you. So a blind taste test is, is usually a lot of fun, especially with, you know, consumer products or things like that. Um, but the point is, it's a really great way to remove bias and to make a kind of a fair choice, an objective choice. So Rawls is going to take this idea of a blind taste test and try to apply it to choosing a, a society to live in. Uh, and he's going to be making some, some real connections here uh, with, with this concept. So Rawls's theory is this, okay? Uh, the theory, you know, boiled down to a nutshell is that the just distribution, right? Or the just society is one, uh, is it the, the one that anyone would accept from uh, behind the veil of ignorance. That's a specialized term there. You know, like, what does that mean? Well, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, in other words, though, it's, it's the one that would, that anyone would choose in the blind taste test, right? That's, that's the idea. That's Rawls's idea of what makes something just. It's just because it's the kind of thing that people would choose without any bias involved. Okay. And that's a very important idea. So, uh, let's talk a little bit about this phrase, uh, the veil of ignorance. Sometimes he calls this uh, the original position, like the, the situation that somebody should be in when they choose a society or a distribution. Uh, sometimes they use uh, the term uh, sometimes he uses the term the initial position. Uh, sometimes he uses this phrase behind the veil of ignorance. Um, uh, again, he's surprisingly not that consistent about uh, which of these sorts of things um, uh, which, which term he's using at any given time. Uh, usually philosophers are a little more consistent about that sort of thing, but it, it's fairly clear what he means in each case, right? And so th the idea behind the veil of ignorance uh, is that the uh, there's, there are things that people shouldn't themselves know um, before making their decision. Uh, so if using the same sort of logic as the blind taste test, uh, you shouldn't know uh, what sort of you know packaging, for example, uh, the things come in because then you'll uh, allow any of your personal assumptions or personal biases to intrude. Okay, so we don't want any of those biases to intrude on society. And so think of it this way, behind the veil of ignorance, the idea is you're being asked to choose a society to live in not knowing who you're going to be in that society, right? So if you look at the whole society, look at all the people in it, you're like, okay, you're one of those people, you just don't know which, okay? And so that means not knowing really quite a lot of things. And so the people who are making the choice, right, of, of, of the society to live in uh, would have to make that choice without knowing uh, any of their personal characteristics. That is, you know, what race they are, what sex they are, what gender they are, what age they are, uh, the whole boat, right? Um, because that would, again, introduce some form of personal bias, right? You might be not so uh, against some uh, some society in which there's, uh, you know, for example, gender inequality, uh, if, if it favored the gender that you knew yourself to be, right? Uh, again, that, that allows at least a possibility of bias to creep in. So we want to we want to disallow that. Um, you also uh, can't know anything about your personal attributes, like, you know, how tall you are. Again, you might be more willing to accept some society that gave special advantages to tall people, you know, again, if you knew you were tall. Um, and so these are all things where uh, uh, you, you just have to you just have to not know this stuff to keep uh, some sort of bias out again to keep it a kind of blind uh, blind test. So uh, you know you don't know how smart you are you don't know if you have a great singing voice etc. Right these are you, you just don't know any of that about yourself. You also don't know anything about your particular preferences right uh, because again those those don't do anything really uh, except bias one person in you know favor of one thing or against another thing. For example you don't know whether you like lemonade or dislike jazz music or whatever. Right. I mean, that's uh, these are things that are sort of irrelevant to choosing uh, a society or a social distribution. OK, so the idea is you don't know any of this. Right. You choose a society without knowing who in that society that you are. Um, and that's um, that's how you make the most fair uh, decision. Um, and that's the, the central motivating idea behind Rawls. It's, it's a really interesting and very good idea. 
Okay, and so what that leaves you with uh, uh, is this sort of rational, self-interested person uh, uh, acting behind the veil of ignorance, sort of choosing this society. Okay, and and this leaves us with some very simple agents, uh, and 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 Rawls specifies that they are rational. Okay, and we mean we mean rational in the sense that they follow the rules of rational choice theory. Right, that's all we mean by rational here. Um, and uh, uh, they the, the rules of rational choice theory, as as seen in the last lecture, right? Um, the idea that, you know, given a certain set of preferences, that they will do what will actually deliver them their own preferences. Okay, that's the sense of rational that we mean here. Um, uh, Rawls says in the reading, it's the sense of rational that's now standard in economic theory. Uh, we don't want to burden it with anything else. Okay, and so uh, also keep in mind that these agents are self-interested, right? That is, they need the same things that everyone else needs, uh, and they wish to live and live well, right? And so they know the kinds of things that tend to, to be good for people, uh, and they want those sorts of things for themselves. They also know the kinds of things that tend to be bad for people, and they don't want those things, right? That's what we mean in terms of self-interest. We don't mean like, you know, s selfish to the exclusion of all others, right? They would only choose a society in which they had it best, right? Um, I mean... Uh, the way that Rawls sets things up, you of course couldn't make such a choice because you don't know who you are in the given society. So the idea is you might say, okay, well this society, this person has everything and everyone else has nothing. Well, you wouldn't choose that society because there'd be a chance that you you would not be that person that has everything. So um, that's the idea, right? So again, take personal bias out. And what you're left with is just a rational, self-interested person choosing objectively uh, uh, from this original position or behind this veil of ignorance. And so let's talk a little bit about that choice. Uh, the main question we want to ask here is what kind of a social distribution really would pass such a test and what kind would not pass such a test, right? So if you're looking at society objectively from behind the veil of ignorance, you're choosing a society, not knowing who in that society you would be, what kind of a society really would get chosen uh, using that method and what kinds of societies would not get chosen using that method? All right, so let's take a look at some examples. Okay, for the first example, let's consider uh, the United States, uh, the, the, the way that society was structured in the United States in 1840, right? I, as a visual representation of that, here's a map of the United States from 1840. As you can see, there's a lot that's different from today, uh, but, you know, plenty that's the same. So, again, I, I don't want you to think about things that are irrelevant here. Uh, so, for example... We don't really care. Uh, don't don't think about like the technology that they had or didn't have in 1840. So think to yourself, oh, I couldn't possibly live without video games. And they didn't have those in 1840. That's that's not really the point here. What you're thinking is the society itself, right? You're not not so much whether they had hot showers or not, but you're thinking of like the way that the society decided who got how much of what, including access, authority, uh, liberty, rights. And of course, wealth and resources, right? Now, again, think of how all of that stuff is distributed, the system they had for distributing it. And that's what I want you to think about, not not like the the, the material conditions present uh, in 1840, right? That's that's uh, uh, that's really the point of this whole thought experiment. And so again, think, uh, you know, imagine you're behind the veil of ignorance and somebody says to you, okay, here's a candidate society that you could live in, right? And it's, it's this one, it's the society of like, you know, America in 1840. And you look at it and you look at the way that everybody lives and the kinds of rights that, that some people have and other people don't and the kinds of uh, you know wealth that some have that, that others don't. You look at you know all things being equal. You're, you're asked, are, do you want to live in this society given that you don't know who in that society that you're going to be? And I think if w w when you put it that way, I think there are a couple of very obvious things that you can think about that are going to make you say no. Right. I will not live in this society, not, you know, and, and just looking at the society, not knowing who I'm going to be in it. I would reject this one as a candidate uh, for a fair or just society because because of a couple of things. Now, if you can't quite think of one of those reasons, think a little harder. I mean, even pause the video, wait for a few seconds, um, because uh, these are going to be things you're, you're going to say, oh, uh, yeah, of course, I wish I thought of that. Um, so, again, pause it if you need to, but but here we go. Again, you've probably thought about at least one of these two things. Um, so, for example, um, there was an institution of human slavery uh, active in 1840, right? It was it was legal for some people to enslave other people, um, and, and that's... Um, 
Again, so if you're looking at the society from behind the veil of ignorance saying, do I want to live there not knowing whether I'm going to be a slave or, 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 or somebody else, uh, whether, whether I'm going to be, uh, you know, whether this society will recognize that somebody else owns me. Um, again, that's, uh, I think that would be an obvious deal breaker uh, from behind the veil of ignorance. You'd say, well, look, you know, if I pick this society, I might be enslaved. So uh, how about no thanks? Okay, that's a, a hard pass on that one. Okay. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you're uh, thinking along very similar lines, about the kinds of ways that rights in general are distributed, right? Who gets to even be a full participant in society? You have to think about uh, the the status of women, right? You're looking at a whole society and like, well, look, if I pick that society, I might be a woman in that society. And again, hard pass, right? No thanks. Uh, women weren't, wouldn't be allowed to vote for another 80 years about, right, uh, uh, at this point. Um, and in fact, uh, there's a, a bit of great irony that, that occurred in the year 1840. I, I mostly pulled the year 1840 out of out of out of my hat, right? Uh, but looking at the year 1840, uh, a couple of very interesting things happened. You know, number one, there was um, you know a large uh, anti-slavery conference that happened in London in 1840. Um, and uh, uh, some some very prominent uh, uh, women activists, including Elizabeth Cady Stanton, were there and wished to address uh, the convention, but were denied because they were women. Uh, again, this sort of great irony. And one of the things that this inspired uh, uh, Stanton and others to do was to uh, organize conferences of their own, right? To to you know uh, to plead their case uh, for having uh, you know women allowed to you know vote and play a, a more active role in society and to have uh, some of the same rights as other people in the society. And so of course. None of that was the, the, the case in 1840. There was some, some tremendous uh, inequality there. Um, and uh, again, if you're trying to choose a society, not knowing who you're going to be in it, and you see that some members of society uh, uh, have really unacceptable levels of, you know, lack of, lacks of, you know, basic rights, right, or cannot be allowed to be full participants in that society, I think that would be a very good reason for any person to reject that society uh, from behind the veil of ignorance. And so these are a couple of the kinds of very easy examples of things that would absolutely not pass the test. And so I think, again, this provides some initial plausibility uh, for Rawls's theory. Rawls's theory at least makes a, a reasonable degree of sense at first glance. But let's uh, take a, a look at what sort of things uh, perhaps would clear uh, this procedure of choosing a society from behind the veil of ignorance. So remember earlier when we talked about what people behind the veil of ignorance are like, Remember, we, we said that they are rational and self-interested. And by rational, we meant follow the rules of rational choice theory. And there's one particular rule of rational choice theory that becomes very relevant here. Uh, and you're going to continue to see this terminology, this terminology about the, the maximin rule or about maximizing utility. Uh, you're going to see some of that language in future readings. Um, and, and, and it's a concept we're going to revisit a lot. So if you're if you're looking at this maximin rule thing and you're a little fuzzy, uh, please review some of that uh, material about rational choice theory um, and then sort of come back to this because it's a really important connection. And so uh, th this is a quote from, from Rawls here. He says, uh, since each desires, each person behind the veil of ignorance, desires to protect his interests, his capacity to advance his conception of the good, no one has a reason to acquiesce, that is to agree, in an enduring loss for himself in order to bring about a greater net balance of satisfaction, okay? So again, imagine that you, you have several uh, societies available to you and you're behind the veil of ignorance. Again, you don't know who in those societies you're going to be. You don't know anything about yourself. Uh, uh, but the, the, the thing is you say, okay, well, this society has like a great, has the best average of all the people in it. Okay. But some of the people in this society are, are very disadvantaged, right? Is this a society that you're going to choose to live in? Now, again, think about the rules of rational choice theory. Um, in, in many kinds of decisions, it's rational to just pick the option with the best expected outcome, that is the highest average outcome, right? To maximize expected utility. That's a reasonable thing to do in many kinds of cases. But remember uh, that sometimes risk makes a difference, right? If there's not a lot of risk, you might go for the jackpot, use the maxi max rule. But if there's a lot of risk involved or the risk is very significant, uh, then you would use the maximin rule. Now think, 
if choosing a, a society to live in, right? Like picture you're choosing your whole life here. Doesn't that seem to count as a significant risk, right? Yeah, that, that you, you don't want to just sort of say, oh, well, I'm going to gamble that I'm one of the ones that are doing okay, right? Uh, maybe not. You want to say, okay, look, this society, society A, may have a higher average than society B, but society B has a much higher minimum than society A. And so the worst I could do in society uh, B is much better than the worst I could do in society A. That's how you think if you're following the maximum rule. That is, if you're choosing rationally in a situation where the risk is very significant. And so uh, the, the maximum rule here is going to play a very big role in what a society looks like when it's being chosen from behind the veil of ignorance. People will tend to choose choose the, the society uh, uh, with the least risk to themselves, right, with the highest minimum, uh, so that they can protect themselves uh, from being very disadvantaged, right, or, or if you want to use it less technically, uh, protect themselves from being screwed over, right. And so again, if you use our previous example, you can think of something like, you know, say, okay, well, look, I'm looking at this society, and this society has some people in it who are enslaved. And so I might be one of those people. And if I were, that would be bad for me, I would be screwed screwed over. So again, hard pass. No thanks. And so uh, the rational agent choosing for their whole life is making a risk-laden choice, okay? Uh, the, 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 the rational self-interested person, where by rational we mean follows the rules of rational choice theory, uh, will, will use the maximum rule rather than using maximize expected utility. So that's going to be, that, that's a very important concept, and you'll hear people talk about the maximum rule and maximum considerations, uh, etc. cetera, uh, in, in, in future readings. So we've talked some about what kinds of societies would be clearly rejected if they're being chosen from behind the veil of ignorance. And I think it's probably time now to talk about what sorts of things would be accepted. What would, what would people look for in a society that would be acceptable from behind the veil of ignorance? Um, and this is what uh, Rawls himself says about this. And he says this in a couple of ways in a couple of places in the article. Uh, but this is one of those. He says, I shall maintain instead, right, instead of ma maximizing expected utility, that the persons in the initial situation would choose two rather different principles. The first requires equality in the assignment of basic rights and duties. Okay, so uh, another way that he sometimes puts this is he says that people would choose the society that has the greatest possible liberty as long as everybody has the same amount, right? Again, we're not talking about the total liberty of the society. We're talking about as much liberty as you can get while making sure that everybody has the same amount of it. And again, think of this from behind the veil of ignorance. If you're looking at a number of different societies, you want to choose in general some the society that's freer, that has more liberty in it than other societies. You want to give yourself as many choices as, as you can have. But you don't want to put yourself into a situation where some people have lots of choices and, and at least and some other people don't have lots of choices, right? Because you then be gambling that you might be one of the people who don't have a lot of choices, right? So again, you want the most choices possible that's compatible with everybody having more or less the same amount of, of, of choices, that is liberty. And he says the second holds that social and economic inequalities for example, inequalities of wealth and authority, are just only if they result in compensating benefits for everyone, and in particular for the least advantaged members of society. All right. So we'll take a, a look at a couple of examples of this, but the basic idea is, again, if you're looking at a society and trying to choose your, you know, a society to live in, not knowing your place in that society, you're going to tolerate at least some inequality, right? There's some inequality that you're going to say you're not going to have a real problem with. The kinds of inequalities you're not going to have a problem with, Rawls thinks, even from behind the veil of ignorance, are the ones that have some compensating benefits, right? So if there's some inequality that ends up just being good for everybody, or some inequality that ends up being good for the least advantaged, then it, it, it's more likely that you'll accept it from behind the veil of ignorance. So let's take a look at a couple of, of, of good examples of inequalities that would uh, be acceptable from behind the veil of ignorance. The first of the examples we can talk about uh, is an example of an inequality in authority. 
Okay, so imagine some society that you're looking at from behind the veil of ignorance. Again, you don't know who you're going to be in the society, but you notice that some people in this society have the authority to uh, uh, to arrest people or to uh, use certain kinds of violence in certain situations uh, legally uh, or. Uh, you know, they have the uh, authority to uh, write citations or impose fines, right? Um, I mean, so, so, so and, and not everybody has that authority, but only some people, okay? And so that's a kind of inequality. But now ask, of course, when you put it into context, you say, okay, there are, you know, there are, are, are professional police, right, that, that have certain duties and uh, also certain authority that, that the general uh, person of the general population does not have. Uh, you might say, you might be perfectly okay with that, even from behind the veil of ignorance, because the benefits to having only some people have that authority as opposed to everybody have that authority are that you have a system of you know reasonable law and order and that not everybody has to worry about policing everything all the time. Not everybody has to be like judge, jury, and executioner in, in all their own cases and all that stuff. Again, that sort of specialization, that sort of delegation of authority um, has benefits and those benefits accrue to everybody. And so that's a kind of inequality that that it is absolutely an inequality, but it, it that inequality comes with benefits for everybody. And so it would be the kind of thing that you would tend to accept from behind the veil of ignorance. One other thing I should mention that's important here um, is that at another point in the reading, uh, Rawls uh, uh, says that uh, inequalities that would be acceptable from behind the veil of ignorance uh, are have to be attached to offices uh, and uh, you know positions that are in principle open to anybody. Okay, uh, and so again, think about the the police as an example. Um, in principle, anybody could be a, a member of the police, right? Could be a police officer, right? So, the idea is that that there's a, a kind of equality of opportunity there uh, behind this uh, sort of unequal level of authority, but th this unequal level of authority does have benefits that accrue to everybody. So again, it'd be the sort of thing you'd probably be okay with from behind the veil of ignorance. Another example uh, uh, might be something like, um, uh, con consider uh, handicapped parking spaces, right? Um, this is absolutely a kind of inequality, right? It's a benefit that some get that others do not. But again, let's put it through Rawls's test, right? Is it in principle available to anybody? Is there a kind of equality of opportunity here? Clearly, yes, right? Anybody might have mobility issues at any time, right? So, so that, you know, yeah, anybody might be in need of something like that. Uh, and so then uh, the idea is to say, okay, so does this inequality have benefits that accrue to everybody? Well, not so much, but instead uh, they, in this case, accrue to the least advantaged, right? And so uh, the idea is you might look at a society from behind the veil of ignorance, again, not knowing who you're going to be and say, well, look, say that we have some special parking spaces for people with mobility issues. Since I don't know whether I'm gonna have mobility issues or not, I think I would choose a society that had some special consideration given for people with mobility issues to make sure that they could be full participants in society. And so because of this kind of inequality um, uh, 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 benefits the least advantaged, or uh, at least some less advantaged, uh, that it would be the sort of thing you would accept even behind the veil of ignorance. And in fact, you might even insist on it from behind the veil of ignorance because you don't know whether you have uh, uh, certain sorts of physical um, uh, disabilities or physical mobility issues or not. So uh, that's a, a, an idea, that's a, a sketch, a couple of examples uh, of the way that, that Rawls's theory could apply to some you know, real social institutions that you're pretty familiar with. And so one of the important things to note about uh, the way that Rawls's uh, theory works is that um, such a society, a society chosen from behind the veil of ignorance, uh, would be highly egalitarian. Okay, uh, the word egalitarian means that it would value equality highly. The word comes from uh, the French word egalité, which means equality. Okay, now I, I want to be clear here. We have to keep keep an idea of what egalitarianism is or what an equal society is and what it isn't, okay? So if, if somebody talks about having a, an equal society or a, an egalitarian society, that is one that values equality highly, they do not mean having a society where everything, where everyone is equivalent to everyone else in every way, okay? That is not what anybody reasonably means uh, by saying that they want an equal society or an egalitarian society. 
Uh, that doesn't mean a society with no inequalities in it, right? Again, that means a society that thinks it's important that other things being equal, uh, that equality is important. Okay, so uh, people are not wearing the same color of everything and wearing all the same clothes and listening to all the same music and walking in lockstep and, you know, making sure that everybody has the same number of pieces of cereal in their bowl at breakfast in the morning, right? That's, that's unreasonable. Uh, and because it's unreasonable, it's not anybody's actual view, right? Nobody really thinks that that would be the way to have a good society. But uh, many can and do argue, uh, like Rawls, that at least that, that placing some importance on having a, a, an equal society uh, might be a, a good thing. Okay, and again, by equal we mean the the sort of things that you would. Uh, uh, the sort of society that you would pick from behind the veil of ignorance. Again. Th when you think, what kind of a society would I pick if I didn't know who I was going to be in it, you'd probably end up picking a society where, where no matter where you were, you weren't too terribly far off from anybody else, right? I mean, again, you might accept, accept some levels of inequality, just not, not too terribly much, not so much that you would sort of just feel screwed over in any particular part of society, right? That's, that's the, the basic idea here. And so here's the idea for how to use Rawls's theory of justice um, uh, to, uh, to, to, to think about social reform or to think about reforming uh, your society. So here's how you use his theory to sort of make some statements about what your society is like or what some other society is like. So the method is this. What you do is you look at your society or any other and you try and imagine what it would look like from behind the veil of ignorance, right? In some ways, this is fairly easy. Okay, if you see some element of society where you say, okay, look, if I am if this sort of a person, or if I'm that person, uh, then I would be at some sort of obvious disadvantage and society doesn't appear to do anything to make up for that or to allow uh, that sort of person to be a full participant in society, um, then you want to say, okay, obviously, no, thank you. Again, good examples would be something like if some people are allowed to enslave other people, you want to say, well, <laughs> the people who are enslaved don't seem to be full participants in society. That's a, a major disadvantage, a major kind of objectionable inequality. And you might see other kinds of inequality where you're like, okay, well, some people have a particular job, like say the police, that gives them a level of uh, authority in some areas that the ordinary citizen doesn't have, but it's good for everybody that that happens. So again, that would be an inequality, but the sort of thing that seems to be perfectly acceptable. So again, in, there are some cases in which it's really easy, right, to imagine yourself behind the veil of ignorance. Other ways in, in which it's kind of hard Right. I mean, the particular way that you grew up, right, the, the sorts of values that you uh, gained from the particular parents that you had and, and living in the particular situation that you lived in might give you some ideas of what is sort of, quote unquote, normal. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and you might say, well, no, everybody should have a life just exactly like that. Right. Uh, and that's that's the sort of thing you'd have to leave aside uh, getting behind the veil of ignorance. You have to it can sometimes be difficult right, to see various forms of life as as all on on a range of normal. Right. Uh, uh, whereas, you know, you might have a, a much narrower view just based on, you know, just by nature of what seems, you know, uh, uh, normal. But in any case, the idea is to try and, to the best of your ability, imagine what your society would look like if you didn't know who you were going to be in that society. It's just, a, a, in general, a very useful uh, way to think about things. And the idea is if you see something in your own society or any other that somebody from behind the veil of ignorance would, would have some obvious objection to, um, then that aspect of society is very is very likely unjust. It's 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 it's, it's probably unfair, and uh, probably uh, there should be something to be done to try and get that element of society out of society. Try and fix it. Okay, and so that's how you use Rawls's method uh, for something like social reform, or to get some idea about how to make your own society better. It, you know, again, no society is probably ever going to be perfect, but the closer it gets to some kind of an ideal, the better it is. And so for an example of using something like Rawls's reasoning uh, uh, to uh, focus on some issues that are very important in terms of social reform, I actually think there are some very good examples uh, in this book here. This was a book called Just Mercy, uh, written by um, a, a, a lawyer named uh, Brian Stevenson. And uh, 
uh, this actually, this book is uh, the you know MCC Blue Rivers Common Read for the spring of 2020. So uh, you know while campus was was still in operation, um, uh, you probably saw signs you know posted up all over the place with all you know sort of interesting quotations from this book. Um, and if you, you know you didn't really know what that was, well that that's what that was, right? Um, it's it's a common read. It's it's a book we're sort of encouraging everybody, you know, students, faculty, etc., to to get a good look at. Um, and so uh, as such, I'm I'm bringing it up here because it it has a lot of relevance uh, here. Uh, so uh, uh, Brian Stevenson is uh, sort of a, a founding, uh, the founder of and the director of uh, a place called the Equal Justice Institute. Uh, and you can look them up on, on the, online. You can go to their website. It's really fantastic. A lot of great stuff there. And the book itself is a very powerful book. Um, uh, it's well worth a read. And I believe there's um, a sort of a motion picture uh, that, that is uh, sort of been made inspired by this book as well. I haven't seen it. I, I can't tell you about its quality, but the book was really excellent. And so in any case, the Equal Justice Institute is, is sort of uh, has a number of things that they're you know devoted to in their 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 certain project. Right. Uh, and a lot of them have to do with the criminal justice system. Um, uh, but largely, uh, they're the sorts of things that you could see uh, being issues uh, when looked at if you're looking at our society from behind the veil of ignorance. So, for example, um, uh, uh, being a racial minority, right, uh, is you, you has some some substantial disadvantages uh, associated with it, especially in our criminal justice system. Not having a lot of money comes with a lot of disadvantages in in the criminal justice system, and these are the sorts of things that just looking at it from an objective point of view. Um, in principle, we could be any of those people uh, who are in a very disadvantaged position, and it seems like. There's no good reason for there to be that kind of a disadvantage, right? There, there, that, that seems to be not particularly defensible uh, um, from behind the veil of ignorance. You know, you're looking, you could look at our society and say, well, look, what if I was one of those folks? If I didn't have a lot of money or if I was a racial minority or um, if I, you know, uh, there are certain cases in which um, uh, young people, you know, essentially children, right? People, you know, 13, 14, 15 years of age uh, have historically been uh, uh, really harmed, right? Uh, you know, uh, the certain people have been harmed by mandatory minimum sentencing of various kinds. And, you know, so one example that uh, Brian uh, Stevenson gave was, you know, somebody who ended up uh, being sentenced to, you know, over over a decade in, in prison for um, like writing a couple of bad checks. Right. I mean, uh, none of which none of the checks were even over one hundred and fifty dollars. I mean, and so it seems like there's some disproportion. And that was, again, uh, the result of some mandatory minimum sentencing laws. Um, so again, it's a, it's a powerful book full of examples of, of ways in which the ideas you want to look at a society and think to yourself, gosh, would I accept that element of, of this particular society if I didn't know who I was going to be in it? And I think uh, that thought pattern can give you some obvious candidates uh, for social reform. And so in summary, right, so some of the main ideas I want you to walk away from uh, Rawls's theory with, uh, come away with the main idea here that the just distribution, right, the, the, the fair society is the one that is selected from behind the veil of ignorance. And again, apply all that reasoning about blind taste tests uh, to get a, a good reason for why that seems to be a good procedure. Behind the veil of ignorance, right? A rational agent is going to use the maxim in rule because they're choosing in a situation for high risk. And so they are going to want a kind of society that has the, the greatest possible minimum. And finally, the result of Rawls's theory is, is a society that is strongly egalitarian, right? Uh, the way to get uh, the best possible minimum is probably to have a society that is in many ways a fairly equal society, one that tends to value uh, equality highly. And again, this doesn't mean having a society where everybody has to have exactly the same amount of everything for every, that's, that's not realistic, okay? Um, but uh, you know, some inequalities are actually on the whole beneficial. Some inequalities help to make certain uh, folks, uh, allow certain folks to be uh, full participants in society. And so those kinds of inequalities are just fine, um, uh, you know, good even. Um, but you know, some inequalities are damaging. Some inequalities prevent people from being full participants in society. And if you didn't know who you were going to be in the society, you'd have a very good reason to reject those elements of that society. Um, and so the last thing I want to say is that it's really important not only to keep track of what Rawls says, right, or, or that Rawls 
proposes that that a society you know ought to value equality fairly highly but why he says so he doesn't say oh equality is good just because it is okay he has some reasoning behind it he has this whole theoretical uh, framework uh, dealing with looking at a society without any personal bias right that's why he thinks that this is the the best way to approach uh, uh, fairness and justice um, and so again keep track of why he says what he says not just what he ends up saying about society